What would you say, I guess, from your research, because you don't you said you don't have any uh, clear personal memories because you were so young. What do you think is most important to know about Vivian Vance and Bill Frawley, maybe that most people don't? Uh, Bill Frawley, the interesting thing that I mentioned in, in my dad's book uh, is that when they hired them, they had no idea that they could sing and dance. Mm-hmm. But they were actually both the musical uh, theater stars. Uh, in fact, when you, when you see uh, Bill Frawley, I think, sings um, nothing could be finer than to be in Carolina right. in the morning. Uh, that's not the name of the song, that's the first verse. But, right. um, he introduced that song uh, in vaudeville in 1915. Wow. And, uh, so that's, you know, I find that interesting. I think there's a couple of songs that he, he introduced. And he was a big vaudeville star. And he was a big musical uh, theater star. But they didn't know that, that they could do that. And, and I think the third episode, my dad... There was a fourth episode. My dad, uh, I had to approach them uh, to ask them if they thought they could handle a little little song. Uh, mm-hmm. And he didn't know if they could sing. And they were very, they were missed at my dad because he'd never heard of their great careers in musical theater. Right. Vinny and Vance was understudy for Ethel Merman in several Broadway shows. Mm-hmm. Uh, but she never got to go on even once because Ethel Merman never missed a performance. Right. Uh, uh, and, and they later did a show, uh, uh, Desi and Lucy and uh, Bill Falling in advance. Uh, it was a special, I think, honoring the, the Dwight Eisenhower. And Ethel Merman was on it too. And they were backstage in the wings waiting to go on. And, and uh, Vivian was standing next to Ethel Merman and says, you know, this is the first time I've ever been backstage with you and haven't hoped you break your neck. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I've never heard that. That's fantastic. And for, for all these, uh, they did, they did uh, not get along mm-hmm. uh, because uh, Vivian was, she was insulted at the fact that anybody could believe that she was married to that old man. Right. Somebody that was he so was much 20, older than her. He was 22 years old and she was. Uh, and 24 years older than the age she said that she was. <laughs> right. um, and uh, uh, he heard her, he overheard her saying something about that to, to somebody, and he was very insulted by right. that. They really did not let it interfere with, with, they were really such professionals that it was not a problem. Um, and very advanced also was, um, she was a skip, script doctor. Uh, she she was very good at figuring out exactly what needed you know what needed to be done if something didn't work. I think watched uh, Danny Ricardo's make Lucy out to be a script a great script doctor. She mm-hmm. knows exactly how to fix up everything. Um, and um, uh, in reality, it was not, not mm-hmm. Lucy. Lucy Lucy had a great sense of, of when when something didn't work, but she wouldn't be able to articulate. She wasn't able to articulate why or how to fix it. And somebody else would have to come up with that. I read somewhere where when Bill Frawley passed away, Vivian Vance bought everybody in the hotel champagne. I don't know if that is. I don't know if she'd be that cold. Maybe she was, but. I don't think that's true. It does. It's just one of those legends. I like yeah. There's also a, a, the story still out there that, that they had a. Uh, uh, they insisted that she gain weight yeah. and stay in a certain, that was actually uh, uh, a gag. Yeah, it was on the Dinosaur, Dinosaur Show, right? Yeah, it, yeah. Was a, it was a gag and everybody you know, takes that as, as, as real. Yeah. It's like what would be the, the uh, at my dad's uh, farewell party, uh, and Lucy and Desi threw my dad a farewell party at their home in Beverly Hills. So, you know, the, uh, also, I mean, and, and they were, you know, crying and they, they, were, they, were, they were sad to see him go. And Desi asked him to change his mind and come back. But uh, um, during the, the, they had a, a musical review that they did. They, you know, they did a performance for the audience, for the, for mm-hmm. the party goers. And uh, um, part of it, as part of Lucy, <laughs> uh, you know, reading from her script, uh, she, she said, you know, but, but seriously, Jess, uh, the, the uh, we don't think uh, this is, is a 
losing a producer, you think of it as gaining a parking space. Right. <laughs> a, huge, a huge laugh. And I later read, I think it's in uh, the book Desi Lu. Uh, it, it says, it, it, somebody says that Desi uh, made that remark about Jess, about my father. Right. Which shows, which shows how bad their relationship was, which is, <laughs> you know, that's how things get distorted. No, it was, it was, a, it was a gag line written for Lucy that she, that she, she read off on the stage. My dad and my mother cracked up and it was, it was everybody else. And suddenly that becomes what was a, a nasty thing that Desi said about. Right. So you, you have to be careful about Yeah, because it, it becomes adopted as fact. Right. Um, now, a favorite part of my book, because I'm a very big fan of my favorite husband. Uh, as I've told you before, and I have all of them uh, on old time, bought them off my old time radio, which I think you pretty well curated. You curated the DVDs, which I watch over and over and over and over again, yeah. and all the extras. Um, which, by the way, I need a new set because I've watched them so many times that they 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 they're worn thin. Um, is there a <laughs> I have to tell you, if, 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 hold the thought with you. Oh, yeah. but, sure. uh, um, if you haven't found them, there are Easter eggs on the DVDs. Oh, yes. If, if you, uh, on this, uh, Lucy on the radio. Yep. Uh, yeah. Yep. Uh, you, you click, if you click, if click. You put the cursor on the on the CBS mic. Yep. Uh, you get a radio show. Yep. Yep. Well, no, no, it's not just the radio show. You get something extra, photo or, or something. Oh, uh, I'll, I'll, starting around season three, I, start, I started adding these to it. Okay. So I need a new set because the one I have is worn thin. With these new uh, packet or with these new packagings where they sell the whole set for like $40, $50, is that a wise set to buy? Or are those ones that you produce or are those kind of ripped off? From those are exactly the same. The only thing's different is the packaging. Okay. So that, uh, uh, except for it does not have the bonus disc with the with the movie on it. Right. But you can buy that separately. I have to buy that separately. I did. I got approval for to do an I Love Lucy movie screening at the our local college here, and as as president of the with the Love Lucy Club. So I put it in the DVD player, and what does it do? It skips. It was a, oh. it was a disaster. I went and I got the licensing, to, the approval to do it from everybody, and I put it in there and it skipped. I was horrified. I said, "Never going to do anything like that again." So, <laughs> I love Lucy the movie. I I love that, but it kind of makes me cringe because I always think of that one thing. Um, but we did a uh, recreation of the Valentine's Day episode of My Favorite Husband, which was a lot of fun for our local yeah. library. Um, and as I've told you before, I was born in 1985, four years before Lucy passed away with cerebral palsy. Uh, Lucy was a champion of the Cerebral Palsy Foundation. Uh, were you are, were you aware of any of the work she did in that way, or is that? I, I heard that she was, but that, that that's about the extent of my right. knowledge. Okay. Well, I want to go back to my favorite husband, and and you did answer a question that I already had. Uh, my favorite husband was not to radio what I Love Lucy was to uh, television. Is it that safe to say? No, I, I don't. I don't think it was ever the the number one show on radio. Uh, it, it, was, it was very successful though. Okay. Lucy was a, a, a considered a big. And that, that's what made her a star initially. That's where people heard of her. Right. Uh, but my favorite part of the book was your dad had written a line for B. Benaderet, who played the, <laughs> the equivalent to Ethel Mertz. And Richard Denning, who played her husband, assumed that B. missed her cue. And he went on, and she did not get to deliver that line. And he had her calm down within a few hours, just enough not to kill him. Do you have any idea what that line was? <laughs> no. Mm. no I, I spent I spent a bit of time looking for that, but but uh, realized that in order for me to, to, to do that, I have to sit and listen to 124 
programs, episodes of My Favorite Husband and read carefully over the script and make sure, you know, was looking for some punchline that was not in the show. And uh, I didn't have the patience to do that. Do you, ha- do you have all the scripts? Yes. Oh, my goodness. What, a, what I wouldn't give to have those or a copy of those. Oh, my. That's right. Oh, yeah, I, I have a one, I think, in the in the book. Well, yes, you did, and that's one of the yeah. reasons why I bought the book, because it had a my favorite husband script in it and a my and a I love Lucy script. You know what I've always wanted to do, and I'll go ahead and put this out there. I don't think I have the chops to do it personally, but I'd love to see it done. On at Ethel's birthday, they went to see a show called Over the Teacups, and you include in that DVD the four page script of what they were saying. On mm-hmm. on on the stage, I would love to see somebody take little pieces out of <laughs> you know like the, the operetta, uh, the story of the operetta when Lucy played the Queen of the Gypsies, or what they were reading when they were reading the murder mystery book when they when they uh, got the black eye. Take little yeah. pieces of each one of those and mail it together and make one big story like a like a a, a comedy spoof of like one of those hard boiled uh, uh, detective mysteries or something, and 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 have it be a spoof of that. Um, but, that would be a cute idea. Just kind I remember of, when I when I decided to put this that script in. in it. Part of the reason I did that, it, it was, it's hard to find bonus material on a show that's been off for so many right. decades. Uh, and now, now you know, they have someone their gag reels and stuff, but there was yeah. there was nothing. So we 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 did manage to track down quite a bit of stuff, including uh, when I was I was looking for on eBay. Uh, somebody was selling a, a ticket to the, uh, the the first filming. Uh, I had a Lucy ticket uh, on eBay, and, and so I wrote to the guy and said, you know, could, could I, could you give me a uh, high res photo uh, of that uh, the ticket before you send it off to the, the, the buyer, just so I could include it uh, on the DVD someplace? Mm-hmm. And he said, you know, I've got, I've got some footage that my dad snuck a movie camera onto the, onto the set of I Love Lucy, and and he was an audience. He took some movies in color. Uh, would you like to see that? <laughs> so I drove out to his house, I uh, think in Santa Clara, and and uh, he showed it to me, and and we bought it. The CBS bought it from him so we could include it on, on the DVDs. And now it's, I don't know, you've probably seen it. It's just, it's just famous. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. So I cut it together with the, you know, it was silent, but yeah, some they were recording sound at the time <laughs> because they were shooting the, the show. So I, I I synced it up and, and cut it together with footage from the episode. And so you get to see the, the color footage of what the audience was in. And although I although I am a purist, I did attend the film screening when the, when the, the colorized episodes came out, and they put mm-hmm. they put it in theaters for one day. Uh, we oh, were I thought, yeah, I heard that was a lot of fun. We, I didn't make it to that, but I heard. We were. Was, it was a reception. It was very. I mean, the the theater was full. People were laughing like they'd never seen it before. It was it, it was great. It was really really great. And my daughter, being eight years old, loves the color episodes. So, uh, um, no, I think they did a great job. I I colorized the first one. I know I, I I'm a bit of a purist too, but yeah, there was one episode that Lucy goes to Scotland. Scotland, yeah. I was going to ask you if that was accurate. Absolutely accurate. Uh, and the reason we know that is, is we had color publicity skills and color home movies. That that uh, um, somebody uh, Lucy, not Lucy, I she was too young, but uh, somebody from uh, brought a, a, a movie camera and took home movies on the set, so we we know what the colors of all the costumes were. And the reason it was, it, it, I, I thought that that was the one that, although I I'm not big on colorization, I I thought that would be true to life. Is that they did that show as sort of. Lucy's answer to I love Lucy's answer to Peter Pan, right? Uh, which was which was on opposite I love Lucy. But when, when Mary Martin Peter Pan special went on, that that show was opposite I love Lucy. Um, they they programmed a rerun when Peter Pan <laughs> came on because they didn't want to compete with it. But uh, uh, they they said, well, we should do something like that. And so they, it was uh, the art design was in color. I mean, the the, the, the audience saw it. A wonderful, colorful set, and so I said, "Well, since that's that's the way it was designed, 
designed to be seen by the, the studio audience, let's, I think it's fine to show it to the people at home like that. So, and we had everything to make sure we had the colors accurate. And so they did a phenomenal job. Yeah. Uh, wow. It's funny. The, 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 uh, Lawrence Welk, you remember that? I don't know if you remember. Oh, yes. Somebody, very much. Somewhat, the champagne lady. Yeah. Uh, she was uh, one of the villagers. In the oh. Course. And another woman in the chorus was Betty Noyes in OYES, who, um, one of my favorite movie, movie trivia uh, facts. When in uh, Singing in the Rain, uh, Debbie Reynolds secretly dubs uh, the voice for uh, um, Gene Hagen, uh, who has his squeaky voice, you know, the, leading, the blonde leading lady. Right. Uh, and uh, so, and, and Debbie Reynolds, you know, sings beautifully for her. Well, that's not Debbie Reynolds singing. Right. That's Betty Noyes. Right. <laughs> somebody, know, somebody had to dub. Stuff. Somebody had to dub Lucy too in her movies, correct? And like Fancy Pants and things like that. Uh, that wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. She. I, it is Lucy. Lucy does sing for herself in some cases in some of the movies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we we all know that she was not the greatest <laughs> singer. Uh, right. But uh, I I love that I love hearing those stories and I hope they put I hope they put Lucy back on the big screen again because that that's really a fun experience. Watching I Love Lucy got me interested in in the in the musical Most Happy Fella because they went to see that show and that's a real show. Um, yeah. But I've never I've never heard. I mean I wish we have a local theater here called the Barter Theater. Uh, Ernest Borgnine was actually an actor here at the Barter Theater, about an hour away from where I live in Abingdon, Virginia. And I wish they would do the most happy fella, because I think that, yeah. would, that would be like a great thing. Um, well, Frank Lester is one of the greatest uh, uh, songwriters sure. in history. Sure. It would just be great to see that musical and witness that, yeah. that musical. I, I want to ask you, too, about some of the scripts. A lot of the I Love Lucy scripts were true to uh, your father's life. For instance, uh, was it your grandfather that had trouble getting passports? So that was incorporated uh, into Lucy's difficulty getting her birth certificate. My grandmother. Your grandmother. Yeah. And yeah, she, she couldn't get a passport. They wanted to go around the world in 1934. Uh, and and uh, my grandmother was born in San Francisco. Jewish woman in San Francisco, uh, and her her uh, husband was an immigrant from Germany, uh, and, and they came over in the 1890s, uh, and they were married in 1909. He died in 1929 uh, or 30, and um, so when she applied for the passport. They asked her, uh, was her husband a, a naturalized citizen? And she said yes. And they asked her if she had any proof of that. And she said, why? Is it because, and they said, because under the law at the time they got married in 1909, my, my grandmother became a German citizen if, he was, if her husband was a German citizen. And if that was the case, then she could be deported to Hitler's Germany in 1934, which was very Thing. Uh, and so they had to search all over the country to, to try and find where my grandfather was uh, naturalized and it turned out he'd been naturalized in Sacramento uh, and they found they got a telegram from Sacramento and confirming it and then they were able to get the passport so that and that led to the passports episode where Lucy had to come up with a birth certificate to she was from Jim and then, and then there was some reality with the handcuffs too uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, it, it actually, the handcuffs, uh, was, it was really more the Lucy and the Dami episode where, where, uh, Lucy, Lucy does a, a, a uh, an episode with, uh, Lucy does a, a dance with a dummy. Uh, Rick, Ricky. Ricky the dummy. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and then she, he gets stuck to her and so she, <laughs> she keeps trying to come back on stage and dragging the dummy. Uh, and I think that was inspired by uh, a handcuffs episode, which was uh, my father, my father was a young actor on the stage and uh, he was supposed to be a, a detective uh, and the, the, 
in the climactic scene, he, he uh, arrests the, uh, the bad guy and, and uh, puts him in cuffs. And he did that. And somehow the cuff got looped around my father's uh, belt loop. And he couldn't, they could not get it off. And the policeman was supposed to take the, <laughs> the bad guy off. Uh, and, and then my, uh, my father was supposed to do this big love scene with, with the leading lady. And, uh, and, and there's this bad guy who, 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 who they can't, they can't get rid of him because he's stuck in my dad's pants. <laughs> and so, and so the, you know, it, was a, I mean, it, it was an unintentionally hilarious scene. And, and my dad did it in, in, in the early thirties, mm-hmm. uh, in San Francisco. But, um, uh, it, you know, he inspired the, uh, the Lucy and the Dummy. I she couldn't get rid of Ricky. And then there's my personal favorite, which this is one of my wife's favorite episodes, when Ricky thinks he's getting bald. You have on your Facebook a portion of the script where it says, Ricky, my head feels like it's on fire. Lucy says, good, that means you've got your scalp on the run. Now, for a little soothing massage, and there's directions as she puts she puts the vibrator, reaches on the floor, and comes up with another machine, a diabolical-looking gadget with two rubber pads, which grab the head on either side and alternately pull the ears up until they're on the top of his head and down until they're touching his shoulders. In parentheses, it says, see the producer. He has endured this particular machine as the start of what has turned out to be a very becoming lack of hair after a sufficient amount of this. So... <laughs> Suffice it to say, your father went uh, to some lengths with his um, follicle challenge. So we say, yes, he, he started losing his hair in, in, uh, in, when he was in his uh, early twenties. Uh-huh. Uh, and uh, and Johnny Green, who was the musical director for the Fred Astaire show on radio that my dad was writing for at the time, um, was a big proponent of all the uh, different gadgets and, and, and creams and things. And, and uh, my dad and, and Johnny tried all these things together, including that gadget, uh, the scalp agitator is called. And, uh, uh, you know, that, that inspired the, uh, uh, Ricky thinks he's getting bald episode. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, that's one episode where actually, um, that scene with the scalp agitator came out. So, so, uh, funny uh i think they um that was supposed to be in the middle of the show and and they're going to end with the uh, the bald party the bald men's party right uh, uh and and they ended up rearranging it and uh, reversing the order because they wanted to end with the funniest scene right because he wanted he went after he went through all that he wanted to do it every night so yeah 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 um so and the question I had meant to ask first, I had all these in such nice chronological <laughs> order, but uh, our conversations went where I asked my first question last. Uh, your father, when he grew up, was tormented by double vision. It, it made it very difficult for him in his childhood and his young life. Uh, did he ever, and how and when did he ever get that rectified or find out what that was? Well, he discovered it, and I have the same problem, by the way. Oh. Uh, he discovered it uh, when he was in the Coast Guard, um, and uh, it, uh, it was finally diagnosed, and they um, uh, he, they prescribed eye exercises, uh, and, and uh, he did those religiously uh, every day, and, and it, it helped him, because his eye problem was, was muscular. Mm. You know, the, the restoration was at a, a different level. It's called vertical hypophoria. Where the restoration of the eyes, they're looking at different levels. And, and if, if, if your left eye is looking slightly up and your right eye is looking slightly down, it's very hard to fuse the two images into one for, to see you know, 3D. Uh, and um, so he, uh, he started, did those eye exercises, which helped him a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, uh, and then eventually he, he, he uh, started wearing glasses and starting like in 55, um, and, uh, they had a prison in it. Uh, 
Um, and so it didn't really bother uh, that much uh, in his later years because it improved so much and what was left was collected by the classes. And how? I didn't, I, I didn't discover it until I was 20. Wow. Uh, and, um, how, and how do you treat the problem yourself? I have prisons in my life. Uh huh. Um, Same as you do. Yeah. But see, well, you sound just like him because I've heard interviews with him, and it's like I'm talking to Jeff Oppenheimer. <laughs> so I know he must be very proud of all that you've done to preserve his legacy. I don't know him, but I know that he must be. I, I like to think that he would be. Um, and he was because of his double vision problem. He was hit by a car driven by Her Herbert Hoover. <laughs> yes. Well, yeah. The car wasn't going very fast, and they were uh, knocked him down. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it was quite a, quite a shock, and more than a shock than, than being hit by the car. Because he was just sort of slightly bumped as he was crossing the street. He was at Stanford right. at the time, uh, and, and uh, he looks up, and there's a the guy who was not too long ago had been, you know, several years before we had been president of the United States. Right. <laughs> right. Um, since we're talking about your dad, that's how I'd like to end. Uh, everybody knows Jess Oppenheimer is the creator of I Love Lucy, but who was your dad, just your dad, and how would you like people to remember Jess Oppenheimer? How do you how do you remember Jess Oppenheimer? I, I, I just thought he was a wonderful, wonderful guy. Uh, he was a great father. Uh, we... we we were very close. Uh, we, in fact, we drive our rest of my family crazy because we sort of go off into our own world. We finish each other's sentences, uh, and um, uh, and he was. Ter ter we shouldn't be surprised. He was a terrific storyteller, mm -hmm. uh, and, and he liked nothing better than to uh, uh, you know, repeat some great joke or something that he, that he heard uh, or some funny story that, that he heard, and. Uh, you know, he'd, he'd always try to crack people up um, and, and, and work out to eat or something, crack the waitress up or the waiter. Uh, and, uh, but he wasn't on all the time like, like, like some you know, comics. Right. Uh, but uh, just a wonderful guy. And, uh, and uh, so are you, if I may say so. What uh, plans do you have for the future? Are you writing more books? I know you mentioned... <laughs> You're going to do the audio book of Last Luck and Lucy. Will that be available on CD or just downloadable audio? Uh, probably just downloadable because I'm, I'm self-publishing it through, uh, through uh, Audible. Uh huh. Uh huh. Okay. Um, and um, it'll be on Audible, iTunes, and uh, Amazon. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, yeah, which I finished recording it. I'm just finishing editing it now, so it'll be out in a month or two. Uh, and uh, and I'm writing a, a play. I've done a, a, a number of things. I have a thing that I call online radio theater, mm -hmm. uh, which which is on my YouTube pay uh, YouTube uh, um, channel. Uh, and and, I, and one thing I did was it's called playing both sides, Jack Benny versus Fred Allen, which is a bit of dramatization uh, of the first part of. Uh, of uh, the book, the play wasn't the last part of the book, but the, uh, that that thing on my YouTube channel is, is uh, a lot of the first part of the book, uh, including some of the comedy routines and stuff for you know, Fred Astaire and and uh, Burns and Allen and stuff like that. Oh, fantastic! Now, will that play be available for hopefully theater goers around the country, or? Uh, well, I'm yeah, I'm expanding it into a full play. I don't know how long that's going to take me, right? Cause <laughs> they can see. They can go to my YouTube channel and then see see uh, the first twenty minutes. Well, that uh, sounds great. I mean, you've been very kind with your time. Um, you know, I'm a twelve dollar a week newspaper columnist, and get to get to talk to somebody like you <laughs> is the biggest thrill of my eighteen year career. So I I can't thank you enough. Uh, thank you very much. I, I've enjoyed it.